Good evening, everyone. This is Vidya Gupta, and welcome to the guest lecture series 2020, an initiative by Technovanza VJTI. This session is co-hosted by Gaya College of Engineering Bihar and Engineering College of Ajmer. On the occasion of National Unity Day, we remember Sri Sardar Vallabh Bhai Patel. And now, I would like to call Teja Shinde to recite the pledge given by the Home Ministry of India. I solemnly pledge. that i dedicate myself to preserve the unity integrity and security of the nation and also strive hard to spread this message among my fellow countrymen i take this pledge in the spirit of unification of my country which was made possible by the vision and actions of sardar vallabhai patel i also solemnly resolve to make my own contribution to ensure the internal security of my country jai hind Thank you, Tejas. BJTI started in the year 1887 and it's upholding its brilliant legacy. Taking technology to society has always been the aim of Technovanza. Over the years, we have had many pioneers like Dr. A. P. J. Abdul Kalam, Mr. Ratan Tata, Mr. A. S. Kiran Kumar, Nana Patekar. All of them have added great value to many lives. Amplifying this extraordinary legacy, we are very proud and grateful to host an intelligent member of RAW, an advisor, a brave spy master, Mr. Vikram Sood. Sir is a former head of India's eminent intelligence agency, the Research and Analysis Wing, RAW, and an advisor to the Observer Research Foundation, ORF. Sir. has over 31 years of experience of being in the shadows for his country before joining the ranks of raw he was an officer in the indian postal service he has contributed immensely towards national security and foreign relations he is a contributing author and has poured the wisdom of his extensive career as a spy master in the unending game of former raw chiefs insights into espionage The book is a solid contribution to the study of intelligence as a tool for formulating security policy in India and elsewhere. It is a supreme example of not only the past and present but also of the security challenges of our times and of the future, particularly in the virtual world of cyberspace. Sir, this small introduction wouldn't do justice to it. You have blended the eloquent qualities of hard work. and persistence with absolute sublimity which can never be unseen we are truly honored by your presence today for our live viewers we will have a q and a session after the lecture so please leave your questions in the live chat below sir will be sharing with us his expert outlook on how nations control the narrative to control the world so without any further ado let's be a part of a conversation of our shared future under the guidance of the very best Sir, passing to you now. Thank you, Prithvi, uh, for this, and thank you, VGTI, for calling me for this. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, sir. We can hear you. Okay. For calling me for this talk. Um, so, hello, young people, and uh, it's nice to be with uh, youngsters and. to to feel their enthusiasm and 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 their bright uh, questions and answers that we might have at the end um today i thought i'll talk to you you know in this great global game that is going on for decades and there's no end to it it's a game for command and control and um we have uh, a situation today that is uh, the situation that they is in a flux but there is an underlying theme throughout history throughout global history which we sometimes do not feel it but it's there so it's not as if you have uh, weapons and technology and uh, economic uh, strength but this one more thing that is required to to have control i'll explain that as i go along and that is control of the narrative how do you control the narrative and the perceptions of the other including your own so that that will be part one of my talk and then the next part is i will talk about about the future 
not as a not as a man with technology, but as a layman who understands, who thinks he understands what's lying ahead, and and uh, it's it's a perspective from a non-technical person. So please bear in mind. Don't ask me technical questions. I don't know the answers. But anyway, uh, then the third part is, how about us? What are we going to do? Where are we in all this? So. Uh, I hope I will finish it in time and uh, not not stretch you or make it too long or too boring. So let me start with part one. There are narratives. The importance of narratives in global politics, where I describe how it has been exercised by the West all these years. They have controlled almost everything in our lives in the past two hundred years or more. So narratives are actually the language of power and control, expressed in many ways. Sometimes soothing, sometimes soft, sometimes very suave. You don't see it. It's about long-term perceptions and total acceptability in the narrator and his version. That is the goal. Now I'll I'll come to you. Later, how, why this is missing? Now, military, economic, and technological power normally def define the strength of a nation. But without a strong storyline, like in a movie, you know, if you don't have a storyline, the maza nahi aaya. You have a strong narrative about itself, the power to influence, command global domination in 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 uh, in its entirety. Narratives give that power in international relations. These are stories nations tell or convey about themselves to the others. These are stories they want others to believe. They're also stories. They also tell stories about the other. I mean, they, they, they. If you see how the Washington Post or the New York Times, they write about you and tell you what you are and who you are, and it's not very pleasant. It's not very flattering. So. That that is how the game is played. Constantly saying you're no good, you're no good. I'm the better guy. You you know I know best. So that's how they want to tell the stories. So a good narrative depends on how the theme is selected, how the story is sold outside. For instance, the theme of uh, uh, what would I say? Proclaim superiority of values and culture through arts and literature. My art is better than yours. You know, we were taught Shakespeare in school, but nobody in Europe talked of learnt Kalidas. So narrative for me was Shakespeare, but they didn't have an Indian counterpart of the scientific mind. All the best scientists come from the West. Of power through the gun, of course, economic might and technological capabilities. We know that they're obvious. And the other thing is, narratives therefore are not built on truth all the time. There may be a semblance of truth or semblance of facts, but these are how facts are presented or perceived, and then how these are manipulated. Truth is not the only god in the affairs of state. Perceptions built on narratives are. It's about advertising a superiority of ideals, culture, and goals. Now, the British ran their empire, global empire, all over the world, but they did not have the manpower to do it. They just couldn't afford to send troops to every corner of the earth. In the manner it was required, so they used native power. They used Indians in India. They used West Indians in West Indies. They used Africans in Africa, and that's how they controlled the the with a with a with a display of superiority, white man superiority, and so on and so forth. And the natives were used to control them. So the population is built is. Is perpetually in awe and fear of the 
colonial master grateful for him to him for giving to to the native what actually belonged to the native and then taking the credit for take, giving it to him that's colonialism now don't get me wrong i'm not a marxist but this is how it actually worked this is a the real world work then of course we had a lot of us who were very keen and eager to work for the master and once the industrial revolution happened and the empire became virtually undefeatable for quite a while the revolution passed by the passed by us the colonial uh, population we didn't get any benefit and they served only the interests of the european masters so major powers are adept also at changing the storyline according to the need of the time and the and or even in perpetuity like today saddam hussein is an angel tomorrow he is evil day after he is an angel again and finally he is evil to be destroyed if you read the iraqi history this is how it comes out that would need a separate uh, lecture if if, uh, if you want to go into all that kind of details now let's take the example of how human rights organizations work normally in the west and we have borrowed them here like Amnesty International, who is sermonizing us on how Indians and in the government should be behaving towards fellow citizens. All human rights organizations do that, but that's okay. It is also true that there is a lot to be done by us for Indians. There is no denying that. There is, there is, there is a, a shortfall in our governance. but how many of us also know that thomas jefferson who wrote into the declaration of independence of america where he said that all men were created equal had an inalienable right to life liberty and pursuit of happiness was a slave owner and he never gave up that true he said that maybe 250 years ago but the point is that if he could talk of alienable inalienable rights then and still have be a slave owner and then see no dichotomy between the two this emancipation was restricted therefore by color george washington thomas jefferson the three presidents who followed james madison james man monroe andrew jackson were all slave owning presidents and that that was a normal Many of the U.S. prestigious universities benefited from the institution of slavery, and have had buildings named after those who promoted white supremacy. That's why you see these uh, statues coming down today in, in the United States of many of the icons of the past. The great uh, this the, the Constitution actually. actually protected slavery did not abolish it because 30 years after independence they merely banned slave trade because it was hurting the local economic interests of the slave owners who didn't want outside slaves to come from outside and cheapen their profit so it was not a high idea the narrative is that we did this but we did this for money and then nobody talks about it now it's okay you know um, robert peel the prime minister of britain william gladstone prime minister of britain they were both involved in slave trade that's where the british east india company made piles of money initially by ferrying uh, slaves from africa to america and Lord Dundas, the president of the board of control of the East India Company, was himself a sl uh, slave trader, and he must have amassed huge profits. Ethics and morality have never been an issue in international politics. Please bear that in mind. The real life of the international politics is national interest defined narrowly by each country. Recently, I've, I've just inaugurated. I've just launched a new book. 
You might have heard about it, I don't know. It's called the ultimate goal. Uh, one sec, can I take it up for you? This is what it is, can you see it? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. This is the ultimate goal. I'll tell you what it is about. This is where I deconstruct narratives that have been constructed by nations abroad and try and explain how the global system works. And and, uh, and let, let me let me just quote a bit for you for for your uh, kind of introduction. I said in the book that if a major power with global interest wishes to retain its supremacy or prevent alternative centers of power from emerging, it naturally must be able to tell its story. Tell it first, tell it well and repeatedly in different ways and at different times. Then I go on to say, all governments lie, bar none, as and when it suits them. The important aspect is to lie first. The principle is, be in with your story first, because any other story thereafter becomes only a reaction. Like the Pakistanis keep doing to us, every now and then, bring out a story. Oh, Pakistan, India has done this to us. Then we, we try and sort of say, no, 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 we didn't do it like this. You did it first. That, that you know, but you're in for your first shot. We become reactive. And then, you know, today, the United States is so strong, or has been so strong, that it is the only country today that can make its domestic laws applicable globally. Ignore international law when it suits when it suits it, abrogate treaties as well, bomb and invade other countries and walk out when bored with the whole thing. Afghanistan is an example. National interest was an ideal concept so long as it was American or British favoring an established interest. Otherwise it was deemed fascist or anti-people a danger to the free world. The real reason was that there was fear in the among the rulers of the colonial rulers and imperial masters that countries might become too independent if and may not be the ideal allies for the of the West or worse, even become hostile if they become too nationalistic. So any narrative about nationalism in other countries, particularly one that might act against uh, Western interests was described as evil, regressive, or fascist. Long before you kids were born, I think, uh, 1954, 56, um, Gamal Abdul Nasser of Egypt and Mohammed Mossadegh of uh, Iran brought immediate reprisals from Western powers in the 1950s because they both nationalized. One nationalized the Suez Canal, Nasser, which was a great uh, wasted Western interest. The British and the American, uh, French actually controlled the Suez Canal, even though Egypt was independent. And Mossadegh had nationalized oil. Both hurt British and, and Western strategic economic interests. So they were all from, they were changed. And recently it happened again in Bolivia. I, I don't think I'll go into all those details because they, they, then it gets very complicated for for people who are more interested in, in, in engineering and technology. And so that is why today the nationalism of this present government creates all sorts of problems for the West and their supporters in India. They think they're going to go against our interests. I mean, making India is a fine concept for Indians, but it's not so good for the Americans or the British or the French or anyone else. 
because it means we're not going to buy their goods if we're going to make it ourselves. Yes, sir. So we have, we have to be very careful how we draw up a narrative and how we sell it. No. Narratives are not created by accident. There must be a political agenda and has to be worked over time. Political dominance is the successful assertion or enhancement of a suitable political narrative. And the Indian narrative has been run for far too long from elsewhere, from from London, from New York, from Washington, from CNN, BBC, all these people, that's the media, and then their own governments. And this means that we have to tell our own story. But I'll come to that in the India portion. So what I'm trying to say is that unless we have um, our own narrative, we're not going to get very far. The Western world has had the means to sustain this narrative of superiority. They control the media, they control the finances, the dollar is theirs, and they control the mind through the internet and communications based narrative. Messages delivered through credible narration or rendering for the audience to be receptive has been told by by them for to us. Then there's another aspect of the United for the Western systems, think tanks of the United States, at least the major ones, are influential in the American system. Because I can be working in the State Department today, tomorrow I'll be working in the corporate sector, then I go on to the think tank, then I come back to the government. And it goes round in circles like that. So each feeds the other. Each is looking at, and that brings about a kind of a unity of purpose. They don't work in silos so much. Now, the 10 US, top US think tanks are the largest recipients of government funds and corporations from the United States and abroad. And the defense equipment manufacturers like Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, contribute to immense amounts to them. Rand Corporation received a billion dollars from 2014 to 2019 from corporate sources. And the Department of Homeland Affairs, US Air Force and Army also gave money. So what the think tank then says matters. And what the think tank says goes into the narrative. They have fought narrative wars through the fine arts, drama, literature, culture, language, and the control over the messaging, systems of messaging, intelligence organizations, secret societies, lobbies, front organizations, think tanks, and all arms of the media have been used for this. Powerful human beings in charge of powerful nations have generally presumed that they have the mandate to rule, correct the world. You know what Winston Churchill said once? He said, he said that the government of the world must be entrusted to satisfied nations who have wished nothing for themselves than what they had. If the world government were left in the hands of hungry nations, they would always be danger. So, the, the feeling to rule has always been there. And they keep their, their uh, narrative uh, such that we, the rest of the world, accept what they say. So today, all information that emanates from the West is considered the ultimate truth, authoritative on all issues. 
economic, historical, literature, the arts, shipping, insurance, oil exploration, name every activity to originate from there, except that China is now becoming an alternative source for many of these activities. But what they don't have, and they probably won't have, but will not make it attractive for them, because they don't have democracy, they don't have freedoms, and they don't have the language. Even, given all that, even today, how many of us would send our children, at least I don't think I could or my son will, uh, children to study in China or seek immigration to China. But you see the lines that are there outside the American embassies or, or to a lesser degree with other countries. That's, that's where we want to go. That's where we want to go. But that is the attraction of the West. The genuine attraction of the liberty and freedoms. We then mix it to think that this is also what they are going to give it to us. That's not how it works. Too much freedom in the other country is not good for me. They must learn to think and behave like I want them to think and behave. Therefore, I, my narrative has to be the best. So that is my sum total of what I think narratives are about. And if you're interested, you can find out more. I come to the future. Am I going too fast? Am I speaking too fast? No, sir. Okay. It's fine. Yes, sir. It's okay. Too softly or too loud? Let no, me... sir. It's perfectly fine, sir. All right. Now we come to technology and the future. We all know technology will explode exponentially. Some like it to a, a bent knee, or some say it's a hockey stick. Take off at a particular point in ways that we don't know where it will go. We don't see the end. It means the same thing, a sharp rise in technological investment. There's no knowing where it's going to lead us. Now the world is today about globalization of thought and perceptions of remotely control, remotely exercise control of human beings and of what they think and can be made to think and perceive and even act. The world is now about bioterror, biotechnology. Human beings are no longer customers. They are the product whose personal data is analyzed, collected, analyzed and sold to advertisement companies and their corporate masters who are the real customers. We are now in a world of also corporate surveillance, security surveillance, in a world of surveillance capitalism, as it were. Sabi kuch maalumayun They know everything. They know everything even, even if your phone is switched off. So human beings, are, that's how we are. We are now in a world of corporate surveillance. We have become, human beings have become the algorithm. Not in the world of artificial science, which may now in a world of artificial science, which some scientists have said would be higher than human intelligence. Ray Kurzweil, in his book The Singularity is Near, had given a date, he said by 2030, no, 2050, sorry. Artificial intelligence will be higher than human intelligence. This will not happen in my lifetime, but it will in yours. If this is true, if this prognosis is true. So we, we have, and we don't know what that means. What if the artificial science goes rogue? Where will it lead us? Now, this is the game of technology, high technology, artificial intelligence is being fought today primarily by the West, led by the US and China. We know this Huawei uh, troubles that have been going on. So, uh, 
few things will matter still in many countries. Few things will matter less and less. Military power, for instance, it might matter in the India-China context. It probably will not matter so much in the China-US context. They're going to fight their their the tech wars, their cyber wars, cyber terror. And of course, we are not uh, immune from cyber terror. They they might impose it on us. So I mean. The, the fact that you have so many aircraft carriers and so many battle tanks and so many whatever. But when they are going to switch off your system, then what are you going to do? If you are if you're so technology dependent that you... Um, a day of a lockout uh, could ruin the whole system. You, a war can be lost in a day. Now, it's, it's good to say that the Chinese have little battle experience, although they are much better equipped than ours. But the, uh, the other fields, they are much ahead of us. One is, of course, cyber warfare. They are way ahead of us. They have been consistent for a long time. They have aggressively pinched secrets globally, mostly from the United States. And, and uh, the third aspect of all this is the economic and trade issues. How they will evolve in the future. And the final thing is the narrative and data warfare, which will become very complicated, instant. I mean, you don't no longer rely on one newspaper for a story. You get hundreds of versions of the same story, same time, same day. What is truth? What is fake? We yes. don't know. We'll get yeah. good, less and less. Yes, sir. So, data and narratives, along with uh, nuclear weapons, are kind of weapons of mass destruction. You add to this uh, climate change and artificial intelligence, then you are then you are looking at a very, very uncertain world in the future. I'm sorry I'm bringing these kind of alarming stories to you, but I think we should we should not lose sight of this while we go around and, and we need to take real um, assessment of where we are in the world, how far behind we are. I mean, it's nice to have a Rafale jet and nice to have all those weapons and new aircraft carriers and weaponry, but where are we in this very crucial phase? where our technology masters will create algo systems and algorithms that understand us better than we understand ourselves. Have you people seen this program called The Social Dilemma? It's on Netflix. I haven't watched that, but I surely do after today's session. No, I, I suggest all of you who are listening in, yes. please go and watch this. And uh, it's it's frightening. You know, there were youngsters who worked with uh, companies like uh, all these uh, fancy companies in the Silicon Valley, Facebook, Google, YouTube, Apple, Twitter, Twitter, Firefox, name it, all of them. They were all youngsters, 30, 35 years around that. Then they started to leave because they found that there were several ethical considerations in, in how the industry is functioning, how we are stealing secrets, how we are manipulating people to buy something, to sell something, to listen to something, all on your screen. 
Haven't you noticed that if you buy a book from Amazon, they tell you three others also bought these books? Okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Or we suggest this. Yes. Then that's not enough. They come back to you after two weeks. If you log in again after two weeks, they say welcome back. Yes. So they know where you've been. You have not come. It's a convenience. It's nice to order at the flick of a button. But they are collecting data. Ah, Mr. Sooth likes to read books on geopolitics. So let's show him more. Let's show him more. His wife reads novels. So let's show her novels. For every aspect, for every issue, they've got you mapped. Right. So, as uh, the Greek philosopher Sophocles said many, many years ago, nothing vast enters the life of mortals without a curse. In our, in our normal day-to-day -day lives, we know that fire is benign. We can't cook without fire. But when the fire rages, there's no control. Yes, sir. Water is a, is, is, a, is, is, a, is a gift of God to us. Yeah. But when the floods come, we don't know what to do. Yes. So, there's always a flip side to everything. And the trick is to keep a balance. And I fear we are losing that balance. And the other fear is that if you don't compete, you will keep losing the balance. Yes, sir. That's true. You are you are in a in a bind. If you do it, you know you're going to go that way. If you don't do it, you know that they're going to come and do it to you anyway. So you know, Americans, the Western world is hopelessly addicted to the system. We are getting there. At least I can see at my in my home in my among my friends how. They all meet with their cell phones and get on to talking to the distant friend, but not talking to the guy sitting next to you. We're exchanging messages, somebody we haven't met. We don't even know, but we yeah. don't want to talk to my younger brother, who I'm meeting after two months. We, this is where we are, we are losing, we're becoming uh, little cells. That's, that's, that is the fright. Fear. So, and, and this surveillance capital, which has been, which is now, uh, it's a new term, I guess, where uh, the corporate sector surveils you, is on, puts you under surveillance for everything that you do, the government does it. So, both sides, the individual is being watched perhaps more by the corporate sector because they do it individually, they do it separately, they have many means to do it. There's not just one entity which is doing it. They watch every stroke that you strike on your computer, every picture that you see, for how long you see it, every movie you watch, every book that you buy, every dress that you buy and wear, they know you because you've done it on the I done it on the credit card, you've done it on some such system, you've done it online, they know. In America, if you take your car to a service station for a flat tire, at the flick of a button, they can pull out all your records, where the car was repaired, by who and by for how much, everything. Good thing, bad thing, your choice. <laughs> so they're watching you in the evening when your phone is switched off also, like I mentioned earlier. That's quite <laughs> frightening. Yeah, it is, it is. We don't realize. We yes. become so addicted. I don't remember my son's phone number. I can only just click and dial. But I remember my first phone number. When the, we first got our telephone at home, 47361. I still remember that. 
because there was no other means. We had to remember it. Yes. Now you are dependent on this. This. Oh, this right. Yeah. So uh, it's it's not it's not good for us. Yes. We are going to we are going to become people who know how to use their thumbs. Yes. So that's what you do on the cell cell phone. So biologically, Darwinian theory would take away the other fingers. Yeah. So uh, they know your close friends. They know who you talk to, what you talk to. They can. They may say it's end to end, uh, end to end uh, encryption, encryption, but they yeah. have it somewhere. It's given on demand, and it's 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 going to hurt our. Mental capabilities is going to hurt our social capabilities. It's going to hurt our abilities to reason, and it will make make governments easier to rule over you. So, whatever technology you invent, please invent something that is a little more benign. Yes, sir. Absolutely, sir. So, uh, I can go on with these endless examples. This I don't think that you you get the drift. What I'm saying, like what we're having today, is digital Frankenstein's that are transforming the world in their image. They want you to be like that. They want you, for example, to wear a check shirt only. We are in thing for fashion. Every girl, every boy will buy a check shirt. Yeah, in the name of trending. Yes, trending. Oh yeah. Yeah. It is a trend. Yeah. So somebody is making money out of this. That it's not. Right. It's not uh, such a simple game. It's not a coincidence. Yes. So the future could be immensely satisfying. I'm sure. We could do a lot. I don't think we're doing it the right way. We're not doing it for. Uh, control of uh, environment. I mean, regulating our and our consumption patterns to to help control the climate. We could do it for food. We could, but we're doing it the wrong way. We're doing genetically modified food, which is dangerous because it comes with genetically modified seeds and comes with, comes with deadly pesticides. If you if you read. Uh, What uh, this company with M, American company, it, it is in India also. Oh, memory, memory. One sec, I'll get the name. It starts with M. I hope it's listed in my book. I can't find it. That happens, you know. After a certain age, you don't remember things. Anyhow, they have controlled this. They give you genetic. The, the crisis in Maharashtra is all about genetically modified seeds, isn't it? No. The farmer. Yes, I. Where does he? Where does he get the seeds from? Yeah. Huh? So that is the problem. I wish I could remember the name of this company. Anyhow, I can't waste time on this. So we have the means to do it. We should have the will to do it. But otherwise, uncontrollable technology is going to ruin us all. Now about us. Which I've talked one hell of a lot. So, where are we and what are we? What do we want to be? India. You know, when I was at school, you were taught no history. I was in a school a long, long time ago. I was in school seventy years ago. Okay, so sixty-five years. Let's say. At the, at the age of ten or twelve, we should have been taught history. There was no history. There was no geography. We could either do geography or French. I chose French, so I knew no history of India 
of any sort at school and no geography when I went to college. And I'm not the only one. There were others like me. The first time we had an a idea about our history formally, I mean, we had read about it a bit here and there, parents taught you something, it was uh, when we learned about Akbar, medieval India and British India and, and so on and so forth. Because when we got independence, what history are we going to be taught? The history that was written by the British, because History is always written by the victor, never by the loser. Because, because Hitler didn't write history of Europe after the Second World War. Yeah. It was written by the Europeans. Yes. The British. If he yes. had one, there would have been no Nuremberg trials. Yeah. And if the Soviets had lost, there would have been no Nuremberg trials either. Mm -hmm. One might have been no Britain, but that's that's a, then the narrative would have been totally different. But how we handed over narratives by our colonial masters has to be corrected. It is good to remember your, your heritage. It is good to know your past. But let not both of these become your millstone. I mean, if some scientist invented something, if Aryabhatta did something so many years ago, thousands of years ago, doesn't mean that there's, there has, can be no development after that. And nobody's impressed by that. So, remember that, remember your mistakes, don't make it a millstone, but know your history, know your heritage. It is important for your self, uh, self pride. Because if you, if you just look at, you know, we, we were taught history of Northern India, of the Muslim invasions after the invasion from, from uh, the time of Ghazni, Gori, all these fellows. They came and looted and went away till, till Mr. Babur decided to stay on. He found it more economical to stay here. The weather was nice, not so harsh as in native Tajikistan. So he stayed on. And uh, they ruled us. Then came the Brits, then came the Marathas, then Mughals, Marathas, British. That's how the order went. But there was some good things, there was some evil, the, everything was there. So remember the past for its failure, remember the past for its successes, but also remember that rivers never flow backwards. You have to go forward. You can only go to the source of the river for inspiration. You can go to the mountain for inspiration, but you can't live there. So, uh, but there was always discrimination. You know, five million troops from Africa and Asia helped the Allies fight the war in uh, Europe and Middle East. There were troops of the British and French Imperial forces. They fought shoulder to shoulder with the Brits at Dunkirk or El Alamein or in Mesopotamia. But when the film Dunkirk was made in 217, they did not show a single Indian face in the troops that they were showing. Two and, a half, two and a half million British Indian troops, more than the size of the Indian army, fought for the British. And they didn't give us a single war memorial. The Australians got it, the New Zealanders got it. But we didn't. And when the troops did their victory parade in down Champs Elysees in France, there was no Indian troop, only the white. So racial superiority was a, was a very 
vo- vocal and uh, i would say um, um, forceful uh, narrative of course the british hadn't come to india as red cross volunteers they had come to make money and rich themselves only so they had to establish control have an uh, give a narrative of superiority they were better at every other aspect and then that's what they did they created a gap between us and them when us being the british and them being you and i and this went on till today you know the imagery of 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 a, of a snake charm first they came to india made us poor and when they left they then accused us of being poor you understand they impoverished us and then they snigger at us that you are poor yes and then they would have imagery of a snake charmer a beggar poverty cattle with the famous remark hindus worship cows yes those are the kinds of things that was the imagery they were creating about us now that has to change the stereotypes basically yeah so in my in my book i write that british imperialism projected itself as benign wise essentially truthful even a gift to humanity in fact it was a <clears throat> typical great power that achieved its status by being ruthless and mendacious i can i mean i can go on and on but i don't think i should spend more time on on this aspect of uh, the british rule um you know we need to have a look at our recent history to fill in the omissions and correct perspectives a country that does not remember its heroes and its history only begets villains then there comes a moment in the life of a nation where it must look back its recent history and revisit the roots before collective memories become faint and externally molded perceptions become permanent and then a call to revisit this past becomes blasphemy that is what we have to avoid that is what i want youngsters to whatever whatever your speciality whatever your subject speciality you 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 must learn history you must learn history as taught by indians there are a lot of good western writers too who are who are relatively um, impartial and there i can name a few but you must consciously be aware of what is being taught to you and why i don't think that narratives or honoring the past or saying that you are a, you are an indian or a hindu or you are a christian or whatever means obscurantism or fundamentalism or exclusivism or exclusive exclusivism because we are an all inclusive country we cannot live in silos so it's there has to be a conscious effort among children youngsters of your age group to have pride in your heritage of preserving all that is precious if that will bind together diverse people in our country which will transcend religion language caste and region it means that we must have a narrative for the past the present and the future which is indian it means as i am repeating sorry heritage pride in your heritage now narratives don't change in a day in a week 
or a year or even years. They take generations. This does not mean we stop trying to be Indians with Indian pride. I think I'll stop here and leave you to have questions, if any. Thank you, sir, for an insightful lecture. Now, moving on to the Q&A session. Sir, here is the first question. 9-11 was considered as the greatest failure of CIA. And in the coming decade, CIA served just these two countries by eliminating the culprits. Can we expect a similar justice to the culprit of 2611, who are in the safe heavens of Pakistan? You know, in international relations, sovereignty is considered equal in the sense at the UN, for instance, one man, one vote. Yes, sir. Power is not. The Americans were present in Afghanistan. They were present in many ways in Pakistan. They had the means and the ability to get these guys. We don't have that capability. We don't have, we are not strong enough. So for us, for anybody to say that if the Americans can do it, why can't we? And you know how much money they spend on their resources? Their intelligence agencies have an annual budget which is equal to the defense budget of India. Total defense budget of the armed forces of India is the budget of the U.S. intelligence. That's huge. Where, where is the comparison? Yeah. They are a global power with global interests, with global fears. So they act globally. They are the only country which has divided the world into military commands. India divides its country into military commands within India. They have a Pacific command, they have a central command, they have a, they have a an Africa command, they have a northern command, they have an America's command. Where troops are deployed, there are a thousand bases the Americans have outside. So it's it's let's not let's not get into that comparison with them. If you want to talk about Pakistani intelligence or Iranian intelligence or even Chinese, it's it's closer home. Yes. They're, they're way they're, they're leagues ahead of us. Uh, sir, that was an excellent outlook. Now let us move uh, on to the second question. How do spies motivate themselves when they undertake dangerous tasks in places outside India? Even knowing that if successful, many may not know their achievement like the armed forces. Good question. Very good question. You know, the loneliest man on, on any job in the world yes. is a spy. Yes, Especially when he's in a hostile country. He can confide in no one. He doesn't know who he can talk to. And if he's frightened, he doesn't know what to do. So it takes a special kind of person to be a spy. There can be various kinds of... I divide them into two categories. I am not a spy. I don't actually go and pinch secrets. I make others do it. So I'm a handler. The spy is the guy who actually gets the document, who actually sees the document, or pinches documents from a safe or something like that. He's the spy. So he's the one who's under the biggest risk. The risk 
to the other chap is there, but it's less because he probably has means to get away from there. But a real spy, like uh, like Klaus Fuchs was, uh, spying in the Manhattan Project of the nuclear, American nuclear establishment, was a real spy. George Abel was a real spy. Rudolf Abel, sorry, was a real spy. They were actually in the business of spying. They were actually hand over documents secretly to their running agent, then who would then take it back to the masters? It takes a very special kind of a person to become a spy of this kind. The other kind of a spy that spy agent, espionage agents recruit are those who are in, in positions of, uh, of value but are themselves weak. Either they drink, they need money, they gamble, they need money, they have expensive tastes, they need, need money, they're a womanizer or whatever. So they have, they have habits that can be used against them. So you use that to make him spy for you. There were two cases I can quote in recent years, recently in the last 10, 15 years. George Hansen in the United States and Aldrich Ames also in the United States. One was in the FBI, one was in the CIA. Both were being used as spies by the Russians. And they gave them tons of money. But they got invaluable information. On the other hand, Kim Philby was not a spy for money. Kim Philby of the, the legendary Kim Philby from, Iowa, from the British. If he had not been caught, he would have been probably the head of the MI6. So he was a real spy. He was a committed spy. He was an ideological spy. He believed in the Soviet Union. He believed in communism. And he and his three or four mates were part of the Cambridge Five, as they were called. They were spying for Soviet Union, not for money, but for cause. Of course, they were looked after in, in many ways, but they didn't have a monthly dole. Kim Philby was the British MI6 representative in Washington dealing with the CIA. And he was collecting information not only from the British, but the CIA and passing it on to the Russians till he got caught. So it's a very exciting game at times, it's a very frightening game at times. It requires an extraordinary kind of loyalty. Yes, sir. To be a spy. And uh, so, um, that's how it is. Life is like that. And that's why people who are in the intelligence agencies are normally more hardline than anybody else. Because we've seen the real world. Yes. We've seen the underside of the world. Yes, yes. We know how it actually works. He's saying something, but he means something else. Yes, sir. And they all do it. Yes. So that was really inspiring and motivating to hear. And let us move on to the next question. We have seen a rise in the global subconventional warfare and proxy wars in the past decade. Earlier it was uh, limited to the Gulf, but since the past decade, uh, even countries like Pakistan are engaging in it. How essential are these to India? Does India engage in them? And if we face them in places like Kashmir, how do we counter this? I'm not clear what the question is. I mean, let me understand. There is, uh, there is uh, sub sub conventional warfare, as you call it, against terror, right? Yes. Sir. Is that is, is I'm getting the drift? And it has it is it is in our region real terror 
I'm not talking about Naga insurgency or Mizo insurgency of the 60s. It's gone, it's over. Started end of 80s, early 90s. After the British American soldiers left Afghanistan and Pakistan, and the Russians had been defeated and they had gone. So the Mujahideen were spared. The Pakistani ISI had learned to cut its teeth in the guerrilla warfare that the Americans had organized against the Russians. Okay. They used the same techniques against us in the 90s. That's when you saw an upsurge of terror on Kashmir in India. The Pakistanis thought they had two things in their favor. They had got the bomb, the nuclear bomb. The Americans were beholden to them because they had uh, helped them defeat the Russians. So they couldn't do much to them. And the Chinese were also on the side. The three things they had. So they thought they could get away with whatever they did in Kashmir. We didn't have anything of that. We had not helped the Americans. We didn't own the nuclear weapon till then. And China was not with us. So we were on our own. When the terror started, we were not fully prepared. That's true. And when things go wrong suddenly, the entire government apparatus shakes and breaks. So your intelligence grid breaks, your police grid breaks, your law and order grid breaks, justice system collapses. So you have to rebuild all that. And that takes time, effort, money, and loss of life. And then, while we were fighting terror in Kashmir, we were being blamed for human rights violations against the Kashmiris. No one gave any importance to the fact that 300,000 or more, I don't remember the figure now, Kashmiri pundits had been driven out of the valley. Where the slogan that night on the 19th of January 1990 was, That is very disgraceful, sir. And we did nothing. So, if you can have refugees of your own in your own country and you hide it, it's a terrible thing to do. Yes, sir. And during the 90s, we had coalition governments who were busy, more busy trying to survive than do anything. So then we had 2001, we suddenly get into 2001, and the whole system changes. Then it becomes a war on terror. A global war on terror. Now mark the words global war on terror, which means Al-Qaeda, it means uh, Hezbollah, the uh, Mujahideen of Iran, it means Hamas. It does not mean al lashkar e taiba or uh, jaish e muhammad because they are regional, they are not global. So, they were not going to bother about that. We got yes. no assistance. We were on our own. Yes, We've been sir. on our own throughout. Absolutely, sir. So that's when we built up. It took time. It took, takes ages. Lost lives. That's why. That's why they they went when this government announced recently that non-Kashmiris can buy land in, in Kashmir after seventy years. Non-Kashmiri can buy land in Kashmir. And the, the soldier says, I have spilt blood in Kashmir. I will buy land now. Yes. So we have this is this is this is what I'm saying about history. You people must know what's happened. 
Don't compare to yourself to the Americans. We were not the same league. Yeah. We are way behind. So let's look at our systems. Let's look at us ourselves. Look at ourselves in the mirror and say, "Kya karna hai aage?" Yes. I think we'll get the answer then. We have to find it ourselves. Yeah. Instead of comparing with any other country. No, अपना मुल्क अपना मुल्क है उसी को क्या करें? Yeah, exactly, sir. And we have a lot of richness in our country. A lot of richness. You have a lot of talent. People like you, bright and young, and enthusiastic. So what is कमी क्या है? Hmm, कुछ नहीं है sir. So okay. that, yeah, uh, uh, so one, uh, we have a uh, few questions more. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Uh, on the recent comments of President Emmanuel Macron of France against radical Islamic groups has created turmoil in world politics. Countries like Saudi, Saudi Arabia have expressed their support, whereas countries like Turkey, Pakistan have called on for a crusade. How will this affect? the world politics where we can see a certain split of the oic oic is a, is an organization if you frankly ask me it has the um, the power of a camel in in your money it is technically a chair they fight among themselves We don't come to any conclusions, but it's 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 a gathering of the Oman. The fight is between Saudi Arabia and Turkey. They want to be the controllers of the Muslim world. Mr. Erdogan thinks that he will be the next caliph, and the Saudi prince, king or prince says that he is the holder holder of the holy sites of Islam. How can anyone else be the leader of Islam but the Saudis? Yes. Pakistanis are just opportunists. Hmm. They will go with whatever side they think will give them more benefit. Saudi Arabia has been kicking them around lately, so now they're trying to say that we've got somewhere else to go. Pakistan is a largely irrelevant country. Turkey is important for Europe. Saudi Arabia is important for us. Yes. Saudi Arabia has been very friendly with us. It has been doing us a lot of favors, and we should remain friendly with them. What is happening in in in, in uh, France is uh, is the result of what I call political correctness, where you you sort of appease the other. You know, it's it's, it's like some French have said that. It's 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 our guilt conscience of the past, how I how we treated our colonies. Therefore, we want to let them do what they do. But that's not how a an extremist Muslim Islamic mind works. You know, an Islamic cleric in uh, speaking in the Vatican at some conclave. 1999 he said by your democracy we will come to you by our by our religion we will rule over you this is the this is the image this islamic extremists have of themselves this is their narrative for your And the European narrative has been amalgamate, assimilate, join in, yet keep them separate. But they want to. The most of the immigrant communities, most, not all, live in their own silos, to live in their own ghettos. They don't mix around. They want their laws to be followed. They want Sharia. In Britain, there there are certain parts of Britain that this they implement Sharia law today. 
there are no more areas to please so europe is in quite have a tough time and i think the, the rest of us should stand by that that was that was really insightful sir so now we will move on to the last question that is the current decade will be very important because the possibility of new cold war in which us india europe and china pakistan turkey on one side how will this influence the upcoming geopolitics of asia <coughs> it's still in the ferment the new alignments are being built i can see one alignment which is north korea china pakistan pakistan yes one axis yes the other axis that is growing to me is america transatlantic europe india australia japan hmm. in which then you have some groups one for atlantic one for indo pacific that kind of arrangement wherever india is concerned they may not be in alliance formal alliance they would probably be uh, like we are having now strong agreements so uh, and let's not forget russia the european countries will probably have only economic heft nothing else america is certainly on the decline but it's a mega power it's not going to go away yes, just sir. like that it's going to stay for some time mm-hmm. and maybe uh, currently it's going through a phase that happens in every country so history there is a slump yes sir and and, and it has shown that in the past it can bounce back yes it bounced back from the great depression and so on and so forth so it it's a it's an it's a nation of uh, immense intrinsic strength also and incredible stupidities also so uh, which they keep making in the in their choice of allies and friends so i won't write your view as just like that there may be readjustment of um, alliances there may be real readjustment of um, positioning but a cold war with which is cyber centric or, or uh, even pharma centric i don't know bio centric is going to come maybe this covid was a trial run i don't know have i lost you know it's okay so the, i mean it's too hard to see how it will shape out i i really can't give you an i a fix on how aligned it's a, it's a it's a global churn pakistan is a nuisance it will remain a real nuisance it is not a threat china is a threat it's powerful it's uh, it's well endowed it's technologically very advanced and it is ruthless we have none of these qualities so plus that's the worry what alignments take place as far well is not really going to आप अपना इकोनॉमिक एजेंडा ठीक कर लीजिए यू गेट योर इकोनॉमिक हाउस इन ऑर्डर यू गेट योर सिस्टम गोइंग द व्हील्स टर्निंग यू विल ऑल कम टू ऑल बाकी स्लोगन से बंदूक दिखाने से नहीं होगा इट्स जस्ट मनी टॉक्स Yeah, money talks. Yes, sir. That was that was. Money gives power. Yeah. Eleven percent of American own eighty percent of the wealth in America. 
89 percent own the rest 20 percent. That's in a democracy. The inequality, inequalities of income. Six mega corporations own the media. Sanjay, तो आपके जो free speech है ना ये ऐसे ही है ना नाम के वास्ते है एक ही सब एक ही तरह all go in one direction. You got to beat that and be economically strong. बाकी ठीक हो जाएगा अपने आप. Yes, sir. Absolutely, sir. That was really eye-opening, sir. So, sir, here we come to the end of Q and A session. So, so we are truly honored by your presence today. Thank you. Thank you for today's impactful and thought-provoking session. Thank you for listening to me, everybody. It's so, I enjoyed myself. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. So even we, we like for us, it was really eye-opening and really a, a, an impactful lecture. I'm glad you. Uh, so we hope you all enjoyed this amazing session, full of knowledge and wisdom. The upcoming GLS will be held on 1st November, and the speaker will be Dr. Jean Marie Le, Nobel Prize winner in Chemistry for the synthesis of cryptans. So, stay tuned for more such insightful and inspirational sessions. I am signing off. Until next time, this is Technovanza Vidya Tiwari.